So Matrika Design Collaborative is an architecture and design firm. We've been sort of in existence since 2005, and we've been doing projects in the museum and culture sector for a while now. Uh, the, uh, the idea that we followed right from the beginning was that uh, designing for culture spaces is a very multidisciplinary approach. It's not just the architect who's going to design the space, but there are various other individuals and entities and consultants who also come in and play their part. And especially when you're working with museums and uh, culture spaces, there are curators, conservators, uh, museum professionals who also play their role in the development of these museums. So whatever I'm talking about is an extremely participatory process um, where the architect is one of the uh, many other sort of, uh, you know, one amongst the group of individuals who's designing this particular space. So I think the credit goes to all of us who sort of contributed to these projects. So the picture to begin with is uh, an iconic picture of a Rabari tribeswoman from Kutch. This is from a project that we did a few years ago in Bhuj. And it sort of represents uh, a, a sort of a, a beautiful project that we did to document the embroidery from this region. So I'll just move forward so that I first explain the ideas of museum design. Uh, can you all see the next slide? Yeah, so uh, within museum design, I mean, apart from, you know, there are two sort of ways of looking at it. One is obviously museum design as a building, but then there is a core design uh, uh, subject, which is about actually exhibit design. So when you talk about exhibit design, there is uh, there is a list of things that come into play when you're looking at uh, de defining that space and working with collections and working with cultural attributes of, uh, you know, what the client has given you. So one of the first main uh, sort of points that we have to look into is domain research. Um, as I said earlier, uh, participatory planning, working with historians, conservators, curators and consultants, they play their part. They put in that brief for you who, around which you can build your design. It's very important for that a particular component to come in. And when I say domain research means you cannot just come in uh, as an architect, you should have that breadth of knowledge or uh, that curiosity of the subject that you are sort of designing for. Uh, obviously, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, there is there are case studies and uh, uh, sort of best practices which are available. Uh, at the time when we were coming into the museum sector, there weren't too many museums. India was going through that first phase of uh, redeveloping their museums uh, since independence. Uh, the Ministry of Culture was putting in the money in a lot of these uh, state museums to for their reorganization and renovation. So case studies and best practices internationally were also playing a part uh, in terms of learning new things. Uh, the, the other part, which is which is very, very important that I would like to kind of, you know, scroll down and talk about is the fact that Museum design is still a nascent subject. I mean, we are all sort of contributing towards it, but there aren't too many people who are sort of building these kind of uh, these kind of interiors of uh, museums, which are very specific to collections and narratives and uh, interpretation. So uh, the handholding part of, of a museum design project is a very important part. So as architects, I think our role also sort of extends towards that uh, very critical area of handholding, handholding contractors, handholding people who kind of build this space for you. And it's extremely sort of symbiotic with the museum professionals. They also learn a lot from how to redesign spaces. I mean, uh, while we were working at the Prince of Wales Museum, there have been so many worthwhile interactions with the museum uh, professionals where they learned a lot of things from us in terms of lighting, in terms of display, in terms of concepts of uh, space planning and things like that. So I'll just move forward just to let you know how diverse museum design services can be. You know, on one side, there is the more, you know, the more didactic part where you have to do uh, domain research and collection analysis. Collection analysis means that you actually study the collection and understand the attributes of the collection, their conservation status, their sizing, their the, the kind of things that they're made up of and, and how it impacts its display. So if you're looking at metal uh, products, if you're looking at textiles, all of these different uh, media have different ways of display because I think the primary part of any heritage collection is the fact that you want to conserve it. So conservation plays a pivotal role in the way you design that space, not only from the macroclimatic conditions that you're looking at, but also in terms of the microclimate of these 
that, that you house these particular collections. Uh, nevertheless, the most important part is played in the narrative because you know we've always had museums. If you remember when we were kids, we used to go to from school, we were taken to museums in a in a, in a beeline, and you would just go inside the museum and come out, and it would be a fifteen minute ride. Uh, museums aren't supposed to be that way. I mean, museums are now taking the step of being uh, more than just repositories of collections. You know, they are uh, they are places where stories are told. You know, about about the collection, about the human use of those products, about the historical uh, connections that you have, or the cultural implications that these particular uh, these particular uh, objects have had in in history or at the current uh, scenario. So. It's, it's very important that the narrative is built. Without a narrative, you cannot do anything. You're just making a display of things. It's just like retail design. You're just putting things here and there, and you're making it look pretty. But as long as you can put all of these together in a story, um, then that's that's immersive. That's that's a, that's an experience. And the interpretation of that uh, through a designer's work is, is the key to that whole uh, space design. So that's how interpretive planning and exhibit planning also play in a very sort of kind of a conjoint role to the narrative building exercise. In the design itself, you have as, you know, it, it's one of the most interesting uh, sort of, I would say, uh, realms of design because it lets you kind of explore everything that you've probably wanted to do, right? From architecture, if you're designing the building, but from interiors in terms of doing the gallery design, case architecture, designing a product where you are going to showcase this particular collection services being such an important part of, of, of a museum because you're controlling climate, there are visitors entering and exiting. Uh, lighting plays a pivotal role because lighting does all the rendering for you of these objects. Then the audiovisual experience, which is now coming to the fore with experiential uh, projects that, that are coming you know, after this very sort of, uh, I mean, the, the audiovisual part is also kind of making its way, but it, it needs to be done in a very balanced way in a place like India. Then graphics information signage all these things play a part uh, uh, in in the in the uh, sort of absorption of that information and never i mean and nonetheless the the most one of the critical parts that remain is the fact that uh, india is also signatory to the uncrpd regulation so most of your cultural spaces need to be accessible they need to be universally um, sort of adaptable for people with disabilities or for people with learning as well as physical disabilities. So both of them. I mean, physical disabilities is something that we that is very common to understand and it's been there. But intellectual dis disabilities and learning disabilities also are, are now being addressed in museums such as these. So we are also trying our best to see how we can sort of do this, address this issue. Uh, from the documentation part, there is obviously drawings, project planning and all of that. This is this is just sundry stuff, so I won't really spend too much time on it. Uh, as I said, it it kind of lies in the juncture of exhibit design, public space design, architecture, and interior. So it's never it's never something which is core, but it, it's it's an amalgamation of different streams and different ideas together, which forms museum design. Again, a picture from uh, Bhuj, which is a beautiful museum that we did for the community. Um, as I said earlier, if you are a person in design, you would love to do museum design because it doesn't let you, it doesn't sort of bracket you into one category alone. You get to do furniture, you get to do lighting, you do you do work with services, you do product, you do technology and content, you do scenography, which is because you, you're setting up a display and, and th that too has to have some sort of a linkage between what you're trying to show and what the background talks about. And obviously, if you're if you if you're a connoisseur of art and sculpture, that's also something that you would love to work within. Um, so, in the typology of uh, in the presentation, I have three main typologies that we are looking at: historical, which obviously is historical, so to say, but has cultural and uh, artistic uh, sort of uh, references. A pure culture and tradition gallery that we've done, as I showed in the Butch project, and then we have something which is industrial, which is fast gaining momentum with you know, post uh, post independence, a lot of our industries, a lot of our um, uh, companies are looking at uh, restoring and archiving the heritage of the last sixty years or even more, and that's where museums are also coming up in these kind of uh, these kind of spaces, and uh, uh, and to sort of you know somewhere there at the bottom, if you see the experiential museums, which is which is something which is a big thing in the West, but it's it's coming into India. But I just feel that you know it needs to be well balanced with the Indian context, and and we're trying to do that in certain ways. 
uh, it cannot be a completely experiential museum it's not a museum cannot be a uh, you know an entertainment zone so we have to kind of marry the two together very well so the first project that we did and i'm i'm referring to an older project just to show you the innovation that we did some years ago uh, this is the prince of wales museum it's the miniature painting gallery that we did for them um, they had a uh, they had an existing gallery and if you know the prince of wales museum is a heritage space it's, i think it's about 98 or 100 years old at the moment so we were working with a completely uh, grade one heritage space and we were not allowed to do any changes to that space so and we were given a bunch of paintings that uh, with a new narrative in terms of how to um, sort of you know display them and talk about Deccani paintings and Marwat paintings, and 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 the whole idea sort of also um, revolved around the fact that it's just not the painting alone. You know there are so many other spin-offs from the painting that can come in. So when you see this centerpiece uh, diorama, this diorama is representative of a zanana, uh, the, the you know the the king in the queen's chamber, and this, the entire ensemble of these objects inside this diorama is nothing but from a painting. So you see a painting and then you see a three dimensional version of what the painting meant. So that's the, that's the giant leap that people are taking now. I mean, this was back then about five, seven years ago, but it's interesting to see how curators are moving from that point of just referring to a painting. So before this, this particular gallery just had paintings, you know, again, just a repository. So that's the that's the uh, connection that we are trying to make as architects and designers that you know what does the painting talk about there's much more than just that graphic inside so that's what that was one key element here another big element in terms of design was the fact that we uh, we sort of worked with a leading conservator from the uh, from the museum and he gave us certain parameters within which we had to work so a miniature painting is a miniature painting it's a small painting it's not uh, it cannot be compared to large canvas paintings that you would see in European galleries. So our art lies in these really small folios that, that are part of manuscripts. And uh, it's important to note that how these paintings behave physically. So, so if you were to pay, put these paintings vertically, uh, you would have the load of the painting, the weight of the painting falling onto itself, and that weakens the fiber of the paper. So what we did instead was that let's let's do it at an angle. And then we started experimenting with different formats in terms of seeing how these paintings would be displayed, what would be the most comfortable angle at which uh, it could be done, both from a viewing perspective as well as from a conservation perspective. So the innovation here came also in the form of a product, you know, in, in the sense that we designed this beautiful slender case, which is sort of hermetically sealed, although it has some sort of vents to let in air so that there's no mold formation that happens. And it also sort of creates this beautiful angle of viewing. So even if you're in a wheelchair or if you're a person or you're a child, uh, you can see this painting very easily. So it becomes universal in its own way in terms of uh, use. Uh, additionally, this was one of the first modernization projects at the Prince of Wales Museum. So this was the point where the entire, you know, the entire idea of lighting just exploded into this new format of lighting with LEDs and technology and all of that and dimming and the right color temperature. So we started experimenting with different types of formats of linear lighting that came in and then we sort of you know experimented and then we uh, uh, sort of resolved it and uh, keyed in on this particular kind of lighting. So these are some images again of how we designed that space. If you notice that the Prince Wales Museum is has a lot of these arcaded sort of, you know, uh, balconies on both sides. On the left-hand side was an office, which they wanted uh, a ventilation from. That's the garden side of the of the building. So they wanted a cross ventilation to happen. So we and they also needed we also needed space for display. So we devised these little sort of slatted uh, uh, sort of fenestrations in the arch, and that created the cross ventilation that we needed. At the same time, the lower half gave us. Uh, space for a uh, information uh, label to come in and then the display of the product at the bottom. So these are some pictures I'll just scroll through quickly. Um, again, as you can see, the floor is just the way it is. I mean, we were not allowed to touch the floor. So these are those old tiles which remained. In fact, we had to do a little bit of electricals here, which led to some of these tiles being replaced and conserved and you know brought in from another wing of the, uh, of, of the property. Uh, again, um, so Coming back, um, this is another project uh, that we did at the Prince of Wales. This had a different 
uh, a brief altogether. This was one of the first galleries that was sort of uh, climate controlled uh, completely. Uh, it and the collection belonged to uh, Karl Khandalawala, who was a noted lawyer. He um, he basically uh, donated his entire collection to the museum. And unlike the earlier gallery where it was only about paintings, here it was about a mixed format of collections that they had. So you had sculpture, you had wooden objects, you had ceramics, you had uh, paintings, um, a lot of different things. So what we did out here was to create, uh, although the narrative was already there, but what we did was we created a narrative of his photographs to talk about his life as one layer and then his collection right below that. So that's how you see that's Karl Khandalawala. In, he was also a pilot. So that's that's him. And then his bronzes also in the middle, the metal images. But what you see in the background is this first layer of pictures which explain his life. And the second layer, which is taking the diffuse lighting onto itself, is the, is the collection of paintings. These are some pictures from the same uh, gallery. Uh, again, uh, the same uh, design of the painting uh, cases were the same. We just kind of uh, sort of use the same technology there. Again, some Gandhara uh, sculptures that, that they had in their collection was displayed. This was a budget project, so we reused a lot of their uh, cases. So that's where the case architecture and the design of these, uh, uh, you know, these cases come in, comes in. These were very old cases, but we, uh, you know, really pumped it up and spruced it up to make uh, new age cases, but with a slightly older classical look. Uh, again, some pictures out here for that. And the King of Patan, that's a wooden structure. And then the entire uh, uh, detail of the facade from, this is, a, this is a product from Gujarat that they had in their collection. Um, so this is uh, another notable gallery that we did for the National Museum in New Delhi. You know the National Museum is one of the most premier uh, institutions in the country, uh, the, one of the largest repositories of Indian heritage um, in, in the country, uh, apart from the Indian Museum in uh, Calcutta. Uh, the brief here was to do a new gallery, a new bronze gallery, which was a collection of 99 bronzes, exquisite bronzes that they had from their collection. And I had the, I had the uh, sort of honor to work with a Tagore fellow on this project late Dr. Gorak Shekhar, who was also the uh, director of the museum in Bombay at one point in time. And, uh, uh, but we completely revamped the, the, the gallery. I mean, the, the, the gallery was nowhere close to what it looks today. And I, unfortunately, I don't have the older pictures, but this uh, itself, uh, it was one of the first galleries where we started introducing, again, uh, fantastic lighting methods, uh, uh, acoustical um, acoustical panels, so that, I mean, uh, I think overall in our galleries, in our museums, acoustics is not given so much of importance. And this was one of the first galleries where we looked at actively absorbing uh, resident noise from visitors inside the space, because when you're entering a space like a, a museum gallery, you need that silence, you need that concentration when you're reading up, when you're looking at the detail of a, of a, of a bronze in front of you. So this was, uh, this was the introduction, introductory space. What we did, the concept here was that, uh, again, a very simple concept that we said that we have 100 bronzes and they belong to different parts of the country. So four cardinal points, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And we had enough to populate all these uh, uh, cardinal uh, points uh, of, of, uh, to say that sources of bronzes. Um, there were wonderful bronzes also from Nepal and Tibet, which were on display. Um, but the biggest, as you know, in India are the Chola bronzes, which are something that you see if you see the South Indian bronze, that particular uh, case up there. Um, these are some of the sketches just to show you that we still, you know, we, I'm, I'm still very old school in terms of in terms of uh, planning uh, spaces. Uh, we, we took the bronze, we understood the form, the, the, uh, the order. Uh, we also made sketches to understand how we would want our circulation to be inside a gallery. I mean, um, there, is, there is often we see that, you know, light is used uh, to a large extent in a very um, improper fashion in our galleries. Uh, what we try to do out here is to restrict lighting to a method that would only eliminate uh, the circulation areas. And what the light would do is that it would in itself uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of eliminate 
a path for you to take around that whole space, while the lighting for the uh, bronzes would remain isolated inside. So there was no, there was a strict barrier created between the two formats of lighting that we did. And what we also did was that we completely revamped the way uh, cases were built. I mean, this was one of the first galleries where we experimented with the floating case. That means we've always seen cases from the ground, but this is the this is one of the galleries where we said that we would take some of these lighter bronzes and we would sort of you know uh, suspend them from the ceiling and 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 make the space much more open for people to walk around. So that's that's uh, that you will see in these uh, in, in these pictures. Again, uh, as museum design says that you know. You know, one of one of the most uh, key uh, comments that I got from the director of a museum at, at the beginning of my museum career as an as an architect um, uh, was that Abhishek, you have to design for the collection. You don't have to design as a as an architect or an interior designer. You have to design where the collection is the king. So it may sound very simple, but it's one of the toughest things to do because. At no matter what you do in terms of intervention and design, your product or your or your collection or that bronze should really stand out, even though you've designed everything around it. So minimalism is a very important part of museum design. You know, the collection really needs to stand out. As you can see in this particular space, we've sort of kept our planes very simple, straight lines. Uh, there is nothing ostentatious in the in the design and the color of the space. Everything kind of revolves around the display of the of the uh, of the bronzes, and the simplicity of the space speaks in itself. So that's how. Uh, I mean, it was a very well appreciated project. Um, what was surprising was that you know th this was a project which was executed by the CPWD Delhi, which is fantastic. I mean, one it's one of their. Uh, premier projects, and they would love to showcase this project to you if, if you ever talk to them about it. That you know, this this was one of those projects which they take pride in in terms of uh, finish, in terms of design, in terms of execution, and all of that. So that's these are some views again. Uh, this is also a space for a lot of uh, artists to come in. You know, uh, young uh, BFA graduates who come in and sketch uh, the forms of uh, you know the bronzes. So it's a lovely space for to sit and sketch also uh, from the art schools around. Um, that's again, these are some more views of that uh, of that gallery. These are Fofnar bronzes, which come from central India that you see on the right hand side, this, uh, the, the slide on the right, and six of them were there, uh, extremely prized and important part of Indian heritage. Uh, so coming back to uh, industrial museums, we did recently a museum in Bombay for the Mazgao Docks. If you know, uh, Mazgao Docks is the premier shipbuilding uh, shipbuilding uh, organization in India. They build ships for the Navy. They also build, uh, they used to build merchant ships, uh, but primarily the Indian Navy is their uh, biggest customer. And uh, uh, so the project was initiated to document 400 years of shipbuilding history. And, and the reason, I mean, these projects excite me uh, to the point where you know, it's not about the project and the and the greatness of it, but it's just the love for history. It's just beautiful because I'm a resident of the city. Uh, it's fantastic to know so much more about what this city did in the last 400 years, and and I would say even before the Portuguese uh, found it. So the entire shipbuilding history, which which predates even the Portuguese, has been documented here. Obviously. A lot of it was done by the colonial uh, rulers of the city uh, when it changed hands to the British. Um, a lovely, beautiful, uh, grand ships were built. Um, the entire history of how Malabar teak was used, and um, and these these you know these really these armadas of ships were built in Bombay. And there are so many connections. You know, like for example, if you see this Vadia wall in front, the Vadias were carpenters. They they came in from Nosari and Surat. They built the ships in Bombay uh, for the British, and they had the uh, what was interesting was called as the silver nail ceremony. Now uh, you would drive a silver nail through the hull of the ship to mark the uh, the commissioning of the ship. So you know more from it's it's less from design, but from that entire process and that engagement and that involvement. Is, is is the exciting part of museum design. I think the the idea here was to create spaces which spoke about a kind of a, a, a linear development of this uh, uh, shipbuilding uh, organization right from 
the 17, 18th century, 17th century uh, up until today. So we did a, a, a more uh, sort of a, you know, a heritage uh, part of the gallery was here where you see this HMS Minden, which is on display here. Then you would have the 50s and 60s, which is more of the mid-century part, which is in the aft out there that you see behind in the background of the picture. And then it was followed by what they're doing now with their, they're building stealth ships, they're building the Scorpion submarine for the Indian Navy. So it was wonderful. So, and, and we work with artists to create these figureheads that you see on the left hand side. We worked uh, with uh, people, with historians, to document the history of, uh, you know, the Vadias and and also uh, fish out these beautiful pictures of Mazgaon, of Bombay, and you know, and then put them in a timeline and all of that. And then, obviously, coupled with all the services that come in, as I spoke about, in terms of lighting, in terms of you know, uh, climate control, and all of these things. So these are some of the uh, shots. This is a much smaller space. This looks much more dense uh, than other galleries because we were restricted and there was a there was tons of information that they wanted us to really talk about. So on the right hand side, you see a cross section of a ship, a sail ship, which was uh, the model was made for us, and then we displayed it out there to talk about. And then obviously, uh, you know, these drawers would open up, and we would have plans of these ships. So a person who's interested in naval architecture or design would love to go through these rummage through these drawers and look at the data that was given out here. Um, again, this was the part where they started building. Uh, it was a British company for till 30s before it changed hands uh, into an Indian uh, entity. So they were building ships which were basically post ships. And so if you see the overall design of the space, there is information, there is an it has a little bit of everything for every type of connoisseur who, who visits this place. If I'm in, interested in models of ships, I would love it. If I want to know about the history of Mazgaon, I would refer to the walls. If I want to, I'm, I'm an, say for example, if I'm an archivist, I would open the drawers and look through the documents. So there is so much of information that is given. It's up to you how much you want to take in this particular gallery. So this again, another image of the same space. Um, and and uh, uh, again, the naval ships, which they sort of commissioned in the last few years. Um, now I'll just move to the next project. Again, documents, some electronic uh, medium through which we were showing uh, content. That's uh, that's the model being displayed and uh, installed there. Now, this has been uh, one of the key projects for us, which I, the, the key, the, the, the picture right at the beginning is from this particular gallery in Buj. Uh, we were commissioned by the by Srujan or uh, Living and Learning Design Center in Buj to design their textile gallery. Uh, Srujan is an organization which is working on uh, sort of livelihoods and also uh, sort of uh, protecting the heritage, the embroidery heritage of Kutch. Uh, they work with various communities, uh, fantastic work of, uh, of the family of the Shroff family there in terms of conserving this heritage and creating this livelihood and also this wonderful organization. They are a Rolex award winning organization uh, in terms of uh, cultural heritage. Um, so this particular gallery spoke about the 10 communities of Kutch and their embroidery. So, so, the, so the exhibit, which is about, this space is about 8,000 square feet odd and it covers the 10 communities in 10 distinct locations or areas within that space. And uh, um, this is the sort of the introductory space. Um, we, because of the nature of material that we were displaying, that was fabric. Uh, when you when you work with fabric, you're restricted in terms of the kind of materials that you want to use because vectors in wood would be the same vectors for uh, textiles. So you're restricted to using metals and other sort of uh, non sort of so to say organic material, which would not be affected by different um, you know molds and insects and all sorts of um, you know infestation that may happen so we were we were working with metal we were working with steel we were working with aluminum we were working with uh, uh, you know cementitious boards and some other materials which were allowed by the conservation team to to be used and we did a lot of research we figured out which one is a voc which one is a voc product which one does a lot of off-gassing and even after setting up the museum we had to actually off gas for a number of days you know we had to leave it the way it is because before the actual products i mean actual collection was uh, you know what's put on these mannequins and these uh, collection cases so this is the introductory part the the inspiration from this particular uh, the screen the metal jali is from the embroidery we did this very simple bit you know we, we used to do this very simple basic design exercise when we were in college and we would make this little window and go over 
patterns and designs and put them together into this beautiful format. And I used that same learning from 20 years ago into this project and then went over their designs and created this uh, screen, which sort of separated the foyer from the, from the main, the first exhibit. Uh, this is how the space looked. I mean, uh, the architect, uh, the architects were Indigo architects from Ahmedabad. They designed this beautiful building for us, and uh, and the building had these, uh, so to say, these um, these light wells, you know, like uh, Oculus in the sky, in the, in the slab, and the natural light would come in. Uh, we had to control this light because you know this light when you when you're doing textile galleries, light plays a very important role in terms of for in terms of illumination, but it also can fade out your products. So we had to control the light from the, the, the kind of infrared and UV signatures that it creates. So we created filters within this space to really hold on, I mean, to really filter off the, the rays of the sun and get this fantastic diffused light inside rather than a very scoped and scalloped light across. So you see the scallops that are created around the uh, around these wells, and those are the ones that we wanted to avoid. I'll quickly go, go through these. These are the older images. Um, we also did a lot of community studies. It's a community museum. It's it's a museum for the um, uh, for the different communities who were contributing their um, you know their embroidery towards Srujan. So it was like a it was like a sort of a celebration of their uh, of their uh, work. So we we went around all of uh, Bunny which is the Kutch area. We went around um, other parts of Kutch, studying their structures, understanding different arts, like you see Lipan Kam out here, which is very common around their bungas. Uh, in the Muslim communities of uh, Bani, you would see these beautiful ways of actually, you know, uh, decorating or rather using that little uh, a wall space on top to put different items, you know, in terms of their uh, cooking as well as serving uh, bowls and glasses and all of that. So we we took a lot of visual and cultural clues for our for our project from these visits that we made to the uh, to the desert. And this is the collection. So uh, again, as I said, conservation studies, working with the curators, working with the uh, conservators, and uh, we studied all their products, and they had thousands of them and how to sort of select the sizing all of this was done from the client side but it was important to be engaged in that process because then then only can you really feel the need of how the design should really revolve around that particular collection so this was this is some pictures from those visits in the basement where they had stored these products uh, again very interactive we did these swatch models for them so that people can actually feel the this is the picture um, and these are the displays. I mean, these are those climate control displays that we made for their products. So they have these panels, which are the, the, the you know, these swatch panels are the panels which describe the embroidery of each community. So we had three layers. We had the layer on top, which, which had these pictorial representations of the women who contributed towards the uh, art. And then you had the art itself at the bottom and then the electronic media, which would add to more information that you would need. So I'll quickly go through these. Uh, this is the arts and crafts section that we designed for uh, for the same space and uh, yeah this is the turban section which is a lot different because uh, it was more uh, sort of open area that's the oculus and that's the that's the filter that we created for filtering in light um, again some spaces we wanted it as open as possible so that you can see through different uh, different uh, you know, community spaces that we created. So you can actually see where you're walking into and where you're getting out of a uh, play of light. That's how we use the lip and calm. So each of these centers was kind of defined differently. And that's how we used lip and calm on one of the uh, light wells. That's the gallery that we designed uh, for them again. But this was, I mean, I, I'll just concentrate on just a few seconds on the on the technology that we used out here. It's a free gallery, any kind of any kind of uh, collection. And what we did out here was to control the lighting and the uh, and the entire suspension system. So we use the human anatomy as a as a source point to design our suspension systems and all of these. All of these spaces on top that you see, we did with Barisol, and we kind of, you know, uh, the hue and the color temperature and the intensity of the light could be changed. So this is a fantastic gallery in terms of flexibility of display. 
So this is the first gallery was uh, the first exhibition was on uh, sort of representation of uh, Krishna in, in in textile art. That's all. That's how you see it. And uh, yeah, so some more pictures here. That's a detail. Um, that's where we are going. We are doing uh, immersive design. The next few projects that we are working is more immersive. It's more about oral and visual cues. This is a project that is coming up. Um, and uh, in a few months, we will have pictures and the commissioning of the project will happen. But it's all about immersive spaces. So um, this, these are a few pictures from that. Yeah. And we also did vehicle design. So for the Prince of Wales Museum, we did the uh, the museum bus, the museum on wheels, which takes the museum from the museum to other parts, the rural parts of Maharashtra. So this is another project that we did a few years ago. So that's it. Thanks a lot.